Good afternoon. Welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us. My name is Michael Sony. I am the director of the Fairbanks Center for Chinese Studies here at Harvard University, and I'm going to serve as the moderator of today's panel, which celebrates the opening of the Fairbanks Center's world debut exhibition of Dazabal and woodcuts from China in the 1960s. The works in this exhibition take us back to one of the darkest phases of China's modern history, the great proletarian cultural revolution, Wu Chanjieji, Wenhua Da Geming, which was launched 51 years ago and became a period of uh, violence and up upheaval that has scarred a generation of Chinese people. At a time when the Chinese party state is increasingly, as we saw only in the last few days, increasingly deploying particular narratives about Chinese history to serve its interests in the present and in the future, it seems to me all the more urgent for us as scholars and as a community of scholars both to bear witness to history and to ask the question, who decides which historical narratives are articulated, which historical narratives are silenced? Uh, yesterday or the day before, uh, my predecessor as director, uh, currently the vice provost of Harvard University, Mark Elliott, uh, tweeted that recent Chinese history requires different narrative frameworks that go beyond simply Fu Xing Zhilu, the road to revival after a century of humiliation at the hands of the West. The exhibition, this exhibition of Dad Zabal invites us to reflect on one of those alternative narratives, a narrative that is familiar, intimately familiar to anyone in China over the age of 60 and almost unknown to anyone in China under the age of 40. The Dazabal that are the subject, the main focus of this exhibition, are one of the most powerful visual symbols of the Cultural Revolution and of that period in Chinese history. Despite their political impact at the time, despite their visual impact at the time, very few Dazabal of the literally millions or tens of millions that were produced, very few of the Dazabal um, survive today, owing both to their material fragility and to the political uses to which they were put, which were very much rooted in a particular political moment. We believe this is the first ever exhibition of Dad Zabal in the United States, uh, and it is certainly the first time that these particular Dad Zabal have been exhibited anywhere in the world uh, since their use in the Cultural Revolution. I hesitate to say their display in the Cultural Revolution because they played a very different role at that time than simply as a form of display. I'm very proud on behalf of the Fairbanks Center uh, that we are hosting uh, this exhibition, which was curator, curated by our staff. I'd like to pay uh, special thanks to uh, Susan Israel, who also joined in the curating of this exhibition, who conceptualized this ex exhibition some years ago and has worked enormously hard to help us in realizing it. So thank you, Susan. I'd also like to thank the Harvard Art Museum for their advice on mounting the exhibition, to the Harvard Yenjing Library, in particular Annie Shi, and to Nancy Hurst of our own Fung Library for providing additional archival materials for the exhibition. I'd like to thank uh, our communications director, James Evan, James Evans, sorry, who spearheaded this, uh, the team effort uh, and has really just worked tirelessly on, uh, on putting this ex exhibition together. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, the anonymous collector uh, who collected these materials and has agreed to share them with us for the next month. Uh, the exhibition will remain up until November 30th. Whether one sees these woodblock character posters, uh, sorry, the big character posters and the woodblock prints as uh, political artifacts or political instruments or historical artifacts or aesthetic uh, 
uh, items, aesthetic objects. There's no question these works are hugely important to an understanding of China's recent past and therefore to China's, an understanding of China's present and indeed future. The panel we've assembled here today represents, I think, what the Fairbank Center really does best, which is to draw together experts from a range of disciplines and a range of areas of study to contribute to a more comprehensive understanding of some aspect of China studies. Our panel today will present a range of interpretations, drawing, representing voices from Chinese history, art history, literature, cultural studies, and political science. I'm confident that the parts will be great, and I'm equally confident that the whole will be greater than the sum of the parts. Let me now briefly introduce our panelists, as is my habit. I'm going to be very brief in my introductions because you're not here to listen to me make introductions. It by no means is, should, should indicate a uh, lack of respect for my esteemed colleagues. Um, so I will introduce all of the panelists and then invite uh, Denise Ho to, to make the first presentation. Denise Ho is Assistant Professor of History at Yale University, a historian of modern China with a particular focus on the cultural and social history of China in the Maoist period. She's completing a book entitled Curating Revolution, Politics on Display in Mao's China. Julia Murray, our second speaker, is Professor Emeritus in the Department of Art History at the University of Wisconsin and an associate in research at the Fairbank Center. She's a scholar of Chinese art, especially painting and woodblock printing. Her other research uh, interests include narrative illustration, pictorial biography, and the veneration of Confucius. Tian Xiaofei is professor, professor of Chinese literature here at Harvard. She, her major field is the literature and cultural history of early medieval China, but her research and teaching interests and her publications extend uh, from the medieval through the late imperial to the modern <laughs> and even to the contemporary. Uh, Li Jie, uh, also a colleague from, from my department of East Asian Language and Civilizations, uh, like Tian Xiaofei, is an assistant professor uh, in the department of EALC here at Harvard. She's a scholar of literary, film, and cultural studies, and her research interests center on the mediation of memory in modern China. Rob McFarker is Leroy B. Williams Professor of History uh, and Political Science and also a former director of the Fairbank Center for Chinese Studies. Uh, his most recent jointly authored book on the Cultural Revolution uh, entitled, was entitled Mao's Last Revolution. Uh, after the panel, uh, a few last words of housekeeping before I turn uh, things over to, to the panelists. After the panel, we invite you to join us for a reception in the South Concourse space just outside this auditorium. The artworks on display, uh, as those of you who have already visited the upstairs uh, uh, concourse will know, these are fragile works. Um, we would ask that you eat and drink uh, in the concourse downstairs uh, and not in the upstairs exhibition space so as to protect uh, these works from damage as best as possible. Uh, there will also be a, a guest book uh, just outside the exhibition space and we welcome you to uh, uh, sign and especially to write your thoughts and opinions and reflections on the subject. Please join me now in welcoming today's panelists. Thank you so much for the introduction, Michael. It, it's um, a great pleasure to be back here at Harvard. Um, so my uh, remarks are entitled Da Zibao, Life and Afterlife. Writing in the American Historical Review in October of 2005, Leora Oslander, professor of modern European history at the University of Chicago, suggested, quote, historians are by profession suspicious of things. Most historians view words as the most trustworthy as well as the most informative sources. She went on to make an argument for the study of material culture or of objects that are as embodied as people. Such objects, she writes, quote, are mortal, they're, they're le although their lifespans may be much longer or shorter than those of the people using them. Today we consider Da Zibao, or the big character poster, an object which is both material and text. 
Datsabal as a genre was a type of political writing expressed on paper in handwritten characters and posted in a public place. As such, they've been seen as a kind of bottom-up, grassroots political expression as a way to express dissent and to make rebellion. Datsabal, in Mao's own words, were a useful new weapon for the masses. Though they had historical roots, the big character poster became a ubiquitous form for political discourse in the Cultural Revolution, which is the period represented by the Dazabao on display at the Fairbank Center. I anticipate that my co-panelists will be talking about the political use of Dazabao, the language of the text, and perhaps the style of the calligraphy and the woodcuts. So what I'm going to do is make use of my remarks um, and my being the resident historian on the panel to take up Auslander's suggestion and first locate these dots about in their historical context and B, consider, or second, consider their materiality. <coughs> Borrowing from Arjun Apadurai, these dots about have a social life from the Cultural Revolution and an afterlife as we consider them today. <laughs> So a biography of Dadzabao, or at least some of the Dadzabao that are on display upstairs. Um, and I apologize in advance. Originally, the, the Dadzabao, as they came to us, were numbered. So I'm referring to the numbers that were originally um, in, in the list. The big character posters on, today, on display today, um, at least some of them, hail from Jingdezhen. China's so-called porcelain capital, located in the northeast of Jiangxi province on the border with Anhui. By the time of the Mao period, Jingdezhen was a provincial city, not a town, but it retained its name um, that connotes a village because of its artistic and cultural heritage. We know that some of the posters are from Jingdezhen because they attack a ceramic artist who was posthumously honored by the state in 2011 because they denounce as counter-revolutionary someone who was once the vice party secretary in the Jianguo porcelain factory, and because that af aforementioned factory was actually the very first state-owned porcelain factory in Jingdezhen. It was founded four months after the PLA entered Jingdezhen in 1949, an amalgam of private workshops and kilns on the site of a manufactory from imperial times. As an experimental socialist workshop, it was meant to be a model. It was Jingdezhen's first work unit with 800 plus employees and its first state-owned porcelain factory. Um, so I think by highlighting its, its history, I really want to um, ask you to reflect that these are real people, um, uh, real places, and real events. Thus, in considering these dots about, we might also think about the fact that, uh, thinking about Jingdezhen, that the workers and factories alluded to are producing a particular kind of product and have backgrounds and skills very different from those found in a heavy industrial plant, for example, in a major city. Um, I spent some time trying to figure out where the paper might have come from, um, so this is the story. The paper and ink on the dots about from Jingdezhen may have come from Anhui, which was its major supplier. A uh, handmade paper from Anhui, Xuanzhi, was made of a special kind of long-stemmed rice mixed with elm bark and was favored by people like Xu Beihong and Zhang Daqian. Perhaps the ceramic artist under attack, who was also a painter, used this paper for his landscapes and birds and flowers, though he was best known for his monkeys and tigers. But more likely, the paper used here was ordinary packing paper produced in small factories all over China at that time. At the beginning of the Cultural Revolution in Jingdezhen, tens of thousands of dadzabao were produced in a single month, and handmade shuan paper would have been much too dear. A porcelain factory would have had plenty of packing paper on hand, and perhaps it's reflected in the length of example number one, example number two, and example number nine, as well as the recurrence of 77 centimeters and 160, 106 centimeters as a width. The first big character posters in Jingdezhen appeared on June 15th, 1966, authored by students from Jingdezhen's number two middle school. Work teams then attempted to direct the Cultural Revolution, especially within the ceramics industry. By the end of the summer, workers had returned to hourly rates as opposed to piece rates, and feudal, capitalist, and revisionist ceramics, decorations, and names were excised. The ceramics museum became a factory, and in the porcelain enterprises, workers held struggle sessions and wrote big character posters. More than 50,000 big character posters in one month. It's probably in this context that Dad's about, like example number two, were written. 
It must have been written in the Jianghua Ceramics Factory, located at the bend of Shengli Road in the central Zhushan district of Jingdezhen, not far from the Yangtze River. The text of example number two is not remarkable. Anonymous workers read an enterprise history, presumably written for the 10-year anniversary of the factory, possibly something written for the local history drive that accompanied the socialist education campaign. It attacked the, his it, uh, attacked the company history or the factory history for not sufficiently crediting Mao and the workers who staffed the enterprise. The dots about attacks Jianguo Ceramics Factory's party leadership, whose name we can trace to charts of factory cadres. It also denounces several individuals who were all presumably artists, accusing them for taking credit for the factory's success. The one who is most easily traceable has the surname B. A native of Anhui, he hailed from Yi County, where, where Huang Shan is, and when the Cultural Revolution began, he was 59 years old. The big character poster labels him an ox ghost and a snake spirit. Perhaps he was, like so many others, imprisoned in an ox pen in his factory. Perhaps if his had a window, um, the, the ox pen that is, and this window had a view of the Dragon Pearl Pavilion next door, B might have thought of the poem he wrote when he was 28 years old. Of the 35-meter-high Tang Dynasty pavilion, most re recently rebuilt in 1925, he, as a young man, had written a poem in which he likened the surrounding vista of city and mountains to a painting. The rest of the Cultural Revolution in Jingdezhen shared much with other localities. Students smashed the Four Olds, and Red Guards attacked the city government. Factions of Red Guards fought in the streets. Some university students and some ceramics workers as well went to Beijing to see Chairman Mao. In October, the municipal government publicized suggestions that included one that said not to make big character posters anymore. As factions tore down opponents' Dazibao, they filled the streets of Jingdezhen with shredded paper. Jingdezhen also had a, a January Revolution. Um, overturning of power and factional fighting continued through 1967 to the middle of 1968 until the Revolutionary Committee began to demobilize people to the, young people to the countryside. Though the Cultural Revolution, uh, argues anthropologist Maris Gillette, set Jingdezhen's porcelain back, um, uh, sorry, set back Jingdezhen's porcelain production and destroyed many of its objects as capitalist or feudal, it was not as deadly as it was in other places. The majority of its workers had good class labels and little education. By 1972, many of the city's cadres were rehabilitated and ceramics production was well enough on track that Jingdezhen was again open for foreign visitors. Jianguo Ceramics Factory reopened in this year. Our ceramics artist B survived the Cultural Revolution and passed away in 1991 at the age of 84. A decade before he died, he published his poem about the Dragon Pearl Pavilion in Jingdezhen's local history. It's Wan Liao, perhaps walking over to admire its construction, at that time still dating from the Republican era. Of the tens of thousands of big character posters written in the summer of 1966, how is it that we have samples like example number two? Commodities were scarce during the Mao period. There was a paper shortage in the early years of the Cultural Revolution, especially as Mao's works were being printed. Likely, Jianguo Ceramics Factory saved those big character posters to be reused as packing paper. Well before the end of the Cultural Revolution, Jing Dezhen was producing ceramics again, not only pieces for industry and everyday use, but also following uh, Deng Xiaoping's visit in 1973, traditional porcelain figures like statues of Guan Yin. The afterlife of the Jingdezhen big character poster thus had a long pause. For decades, it must have sat in a stack of packing paper, only to be reused to wrap objects purchased by the anonymous collector who brought us this exhibition today. By way of conclusion, I'd like to reflect on this new afterlife of the big character poster. Unlike, perhaps, ceramics, uh, the Dazibao were meant to be ephemeral. Though sometimes likened to gra graffiti, these are words that are posted on paper, which they can be removed. What does it mean to have big character posters as art and artifact of the Cultural Revolution? Heretofore, exhibitions of the Cultural Revolution have included ceramics with political themes. And certainly, a display of Chinese ceramics will have pieces from Jing De Jing Dezhen. By displaying these big character posters, this exhibit suggests that we have something to learn from their physicality and materiality as well. 
with this biography then of one of those gods of all, example number two, I'd like to juxtapose this piece of ephemera with the art that it quite literally contained. Thank you. Thank you. It's so wonderful to see so many people here on such short notice, and I think it's a testimony to the continuing relevance of studying the Cultural Revolution and changing interpretations. Uh, nothing in the pre-modern period quite compares with Cultural Revolution Dadzabao. However, displays of text were made in durable materials that were intended to preserve the content in perpetuity. Examples that come to mind include inscriptions by emperors, officials, and scholarly visitors to Tai Shan, Mount Tai, which is uh, where this image comes from. Um, some of these inscriptions had religious purposes uh, to preserve the uh, Buddha's way in times of darkness, for example, or sometimes they were texts of sutras. Several emperors from the Han Dynasty onward also had the Confucian classics carved on stone tablets to promulgate authoritative versions and uh, disseminate them. Such tablets might be housed in a Confucian temple, as in the case of the Beilin, which was formerly the Confucian temple in Xi'an. And rubbings made uh, from those tablets would have uh, circulated the text to other academies and uh, again been the way that people would study the classics. Imperial inscriptions in large characters were also preserved and replicated in the same way through rubbings. While some of these texts certainly were political in nature, they seem rarely to have been overtly topical in the way that the Dadza Bao are, and as we've just been hearing uh, in Denise's presentation. Stone tablets listing successful candidates in the civil service examinations uh, offer yet another example, and I could probably come up with uh, more such examples, but I think the point is that these are not intended to be ephemeral. They are to preserve their content for centuries, for future generations. And very often, they come from the uh, ruling class or the emperor, even, uh, and go on uh, down to the populace that way. However, the people who would see displays such as this probably were not often members of the general public, uh, but rather scholars and officials and other members of the elite. Now, it's well known that Chairman Mao himself was a skilled calligrapher who used displays of his own writing to increase his influence. And others used it to borrow his authority in some way, such as on uh, institutional name boards. Uh, here we have uh, Beijing University's uh, sign written in Mao's calligraphy and uh, titles of journals, uh, the Zhongguo Funyu, for example. Uh, very often, it wasn't that Mao directly wrote for these uh, places, but rather the characters were copied uh, by the people who wanted to borrow some of his charisma. <laughs> now, famously, Chairman Mao conferred his blessing on the Red Guards, Dadza Bao, by writing one of his own in August of 1966. And this event is illustrated in posters and paintings and reproduced in textiles and disseminated uh, quite uh, widely. The Dodds of Bao became uh, essential reading for people to keep up with frequent ideological and factional shifts. And the visual effects of so many must have been rather overwhelming at times. And I think these. Um, photographs give some sense of just how profuse uh, they could be. The violence of some of the campaigns is also conveyed visually and vividly through such means as crossing out the names of people who are being denounced and writing over, uh, over top of uh, the original message. Now, in later art, in the mid-1980s, uh, some of the avant-garde artists uh, 
take as their subject this visual profusion and communicative overload uh, in their own works that are in some ways commenting on the Cultural Revolution. Uh, probably one of the best known is the artist Gu Da. And here there are two different works. Uh, the one on the left called Negative and Positive Characters has the characters uh, Jung for correct and Fan for contrary written right way, upside down, backwards, and in various uh, confusing ways as if to suggest that it's not clear what is correct and what is um, oppositional. In his other work on the right, uh, he had his students at the Zhejiang Art Academy write the character Jing, the one that we saw earlier, if you might have noticed in uh, the Beilin, uh, it means still or quiet. And it seems that he arbitrarily crossed out or circled uh, his students' efforts, uh, indicating either disapproval or approval in the same way that uh, people's names might have been handled in Cultural Revolution posters. Now, the artist Wu Shan Zhuang uh, created an installation that recreates the cacophony of the Dadzabao writings. And this is from uh, 1986. He has several other installations on this theme of uh, the red humor, uh, red humor series. And they often had banal messages, such as in this case, apparently it says, today, no water. And I'm sure everyone is familiar with Xu Bing's Tian Shu, the book from the sky. <coughs> And it has been exhibited in many different institutions. I must proudly add as a footnote, the first time in the United States was at the University of Wisconsin Museum, 1991. Uh, in any case, he created this uh, from carving nonsense characters out of wood blocks and then using them to print very high quality uh, production of books and hanging scrolls and uh, broadsheets which he then mounted into uh, installation. And this is uh, the one that was shown in the China Avant-Garde exhibition in February of 1989, the one that was shut down because of the artist who fired a pistol at her work. Now, pictorial posters also played a crucial role in communicating the frequent changes of policy. In the early phase, uh, represented by the posters in this exhibition, the emphasis was on attacking revisionism, often personified by tiny figures being crushed by the righteous fists of the proletariat. The visual language of the red and black woodcuts by Red Guard groups owes much to the leftist woodcut artists active in the 1930s. Uh, such as Li Hua and Hui Chuan. These are two very famous examples of, from that earlier movement. And they, in turn, were inspired by German expressionist artists uh, such as Kate Kollwitz and others from the 1920s. Now, the kinds of features that we tend to focus on are the exaggerated expressions, the uh, strong muscular bodies, uh, vivid emotions, and so forth. Uh, the Red Guards uh, disseminated their pictorial posters in a couple of ways. They had publications, and they also had frequent exhibitions. And uh, I'm really not an expert on this period, but I was just uh, recently rereading Julia Andrews' book on painters and politics in, uh, what is it, modern China or whatever. It's 20th century China. Very good book that I think uh, gives a lot of uh, useful background to uh, the Red Guards' activity at this time. It seems that after the initial ideological uh, violence of the campaigns against revisionism, a more prominent theme comes to be the idolization of Chairman Mao, the cult of Mao, as we often like to uh, refer to it. Uh, this godlike Chairman Mao becomes increasingly prominent in posters, and his head is often shown looming large over his devoted followers. And the Little Red Book of quotations from his writing is uh, virtually uh, ubiquitous, uh, either people holding it, waving it in the air, or holding it to their chest. 
because it's an essential accessory, as this poster uh, on the right uh, tells you. You have to have your book. Lest we think that all of the posters have a very strident and violent appearance, uh, they don't always. Some of them even incorporate elements from Chinese uh, nianhua or, or folk uh, prints. Uh, if you notice the uh, double happiness character down in the lower right of this particular poster, as well as the repetition of Chairman Mao's uh, profile or his head in the upper left. Now, uh, the uh, political pop artist uh, Wang Guangyi uh, effectively spoofed this uh, visual style in his uh, series that he seems to have uh, found to be a very lucrative uh, avenue of production for uh, quite a few years, starting in the, uh, 1993, I believe. Uh, the so-called Great Criticism series, in which he took on a whole range of uh, products and uh, Vary the names and figures to some extent, but it's really one basic idea which brings out the essential similarity between advertising, commercial advertising, and political ideological campaigns. So I think, as I've mentioned, the Cultural Revolution continues to be something that we're engaged with in various ways. and. Uh, artists, uh, no less than historians and other kinds of scholars uh, have had their say and will continue to do so. Thank you. I want to say I really appreciate the opportunity um, to be here um, discussing these posters. This is really fascinating exhibit. I'm so glad that uh, Fairbank Center is doing this. Um, so um, for the past um, almost two decades now, I've been teaching a course um, at Harvard called um, Art and Violence in the Cultural Revolution. Um, it's basically a course uh, in which we reflect how art um, can be a form of a violence and uh, how violence can be turned into an exquisite art. So um, <laughs> I want to uh, share with you some of the slides I uh, would often use uh, in this class. And um, um, so I, I'm going to flip a few slides and show you some images. And I'm going to ask you this question, which I often pose to my students in this class. OK, so this is the first um, photo. Uh, you can see a man you know, standing, I think, um, on the uh, shoulder of one person, and also his other foot is being supported uh, by some person there. And it looks like to me that he's posting probably um, one of those uh, that's about right. And uh, here's another one. Okay. And I, I won't give running commentary. I just want you to look at this and think what do you see? Okay. And here's another one. Maybe just a little chip. Um, look at the <laughs> relative kind of proportion of the human bodies, the human beings, and the size of the Dazibao and the height of the Dazibao. And uh, think about this. And here is the, uh, a little gem. <laughs> <laughs> Here, so you can see the uh, the scene of production of that about right there being captured by the photographer. You can also see this looks to me like a four-storied building, <laughs> um, and you can see from the fourth floor there, you know, people, several people sticking their heads out, and uh, looks to me like they are posting those two. Um, uh, what do you call it, uh, the big slogan, um, you know, prints, right, Biao Yu. And uh, you also see a lot of Da Zibao 
um, covering up the entire building. So um, here's the question I would always ask my students. <laughs> I would say, you know, there's something wrong with this photo. What is wrong? See if there's any um, member in the audience who care to um, offer answer or um, <laughs> Or do you think there's nothing wrong? This is one of the most normal things in the world. Yes. Many but, of us don't speak Chinese mm -hmm. or read Chinese, mm -hmm. so that it would there's, there's no way for us to have any idea what the messages of these right. portraits are unless you tell us. Great, <laughs> great, great <laughs> comment. But let me ask you a question. Do you think that matters in this case? I'm well, sure it does. Okay. <laughs> it does and it doesn't. Yes, this I would see there were windows other than on the top. That these have to be covering windows and possibly balconies and windows. Uh-huh. Yeah. Over the of the building. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, I think. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Rudolph. That's a great, great observation. Exactly. You really kind of hit the bullseye can you, here. Can you repeat it for those of us who didn't hear? <laughs> you didn't hear? The exact really? observation. <laughs> Rudolph, can you raise your voice for our Michael to? For most of the people down there, what is high up there is unreadable. <laughs> and part of the fact that everybody who has taught Chinese students knows that a sizable amount of them are short-sighted and too big to have <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, now, <laughs> now I can actually answer the, uh, the question um, posed by the gentleman sitting in the back. I say, yes, I agree with you. I think it, it, it matters, and also it doesn't matter. What it matters, of course, I think with the huge kind of a big print, uh, big slogan thing, you know, the Biao Yu thing, which looks like those, you know, uh, spring festival couplets, right? Dui Lian, very much, you know, even though it's the content is as far from um, the festive Dui Lian as, you know, the Chun, Chun Lian as possible, spring couplets as possible. But but for those, yes, you do see those words, you know, even even for, you know, people who are too vain to put glasses on, or, or not too vain, but in the Cultural Revolution, if you wear glasses, you may be immediately taken to be a writist, right, because wow. you're an intellectual, you know, you read too many books, and so that's why you're nearsighted, you know, um, that sort of thing. But, you know, so for those words, yes, you can see, but then the thing, you know, when you think about it, this has always amazed me, is that, you know, I do after seeing a lot of uh, photos, you know, a lot of uh, photos of, of Da Zibao uh, like this, you know, I've come to kind of really believe that, you know, um, Da Zibao really was not or was not just meant for reading, but also it was meant for viewing. Right, it because it just really forms a stunning kind of amazing visual spectacle. And imagine, you know, you are, rather than in this very nice, you know, Thai auditorium, imagine what if, you know, what if Michael just say that, let's put all the dust ball around all over the place, you know, the ceiling and all top. And also, not only that, but also um, during this period, people were uh, commanded, you know, to look and they were commanded to read. And you're actually compelled to, because everywhere you go, if a building could be covered up like that, you know. So this kind of visual obstacle is, I find it very oppressive. That in itself is already, I think, a kind of a statement. And a kind of, you know, really, you know, powerful sort of a political kind of, a, of a action. And I really don't think, you know, anybody would expect to be able to read, you know, the words from the top of the uh, fourth floor building, you know, like that. So, um, <laughs> And I, I find also, you know, I was um, reading all the um, the, the Da Zibao uh, exhibit uh, this time, um, and I find a lot of fascinating examples. And so, for example, you f not only you were, you, first of all, you were um, compelled, ordered, commanded. 
to produce Da Zibao, to write, you know. So when Da Zibao on exhibit today, the content is actually um, Ju Lingdao, why don't you bureau leaders write Da Zibao? So I show you this, uh, it's a kind of, um, with some distance, you know, in time and everything, you know, you kind of uh, decontextualize when you see this. This is a, <laughs> a black comedy, right? All workers in our bureau hold high the great red flag of Mao Zedong's thought and have written more than 2,000 pieces of big character posters. But why don't our bureau leaders actively participate in writing big character posters? Why? Why? <laughs> I hope you can take action at once. And, and this is the, uh, the killer here. 1966, June 19th. So, I mean, the, the, the great cultural revolution had just started sort of in earnest, I suppose, in April or actually May of 1966. So even in about um, the time of one month or a couple of months, the, the, the wonderful workers of the Bureau of, actually I think it's the Bureau of Electricity, I, <laughs> the electricity supply have already written over 2,000 uh, big character posters. And then, you know, so their, their um, bureau leaders are, you know, challenged here in the Stats about why don't you write? You know, so if you don't write, then you're counter-revolutionary. There's uh, some problem with you. So you, you feel like under the circumstances like that, you feel like you have to write, you have to join in, right? Um, and here's another one. So you not only you have to write, but you also have to read. You have to look. And so that's another thing I find really interesting. So number nine, uh, Da Zibao exhibit, and so on and so So Xin Huai Gui Tai So with the dark intentions in his mind, uh, so and so was afraid of sunlight. And due to his evil thoughts, of course he was afraid of revolutionary big character posters. As soon as he sees a big character poster, his entire body is covered in sweat, like a rat. <laughs> He's absolutely a counter-revolutionary. <laughs> um, and another thing, um, you know, just um, um, I, I don't want to disappoint Denise because I feel like I need to talk about rhetorical style. <laughs> no, I'm predicting that literature scholar. I do notice, actually, I do notice that, you know, there's a one, one of the most um, distinguished kind of a, you know, characteristic, you know, kind of a rhetorical style, you know, of this, what I call the Da Pi Pan Wen Di, the great critique style, is the use of the, um, <clears throat> is the use of this ver uh, verb, Kan. Look, you know, um, you see this being repeated over and over again, not just in Da Zibao, but also in the, um, you know, the uh, grand critique, all the Pi Pan Wen Zhang that you, you, you know, you see daily in newspapers and everything, you know. So, for example, just a few examples, you know, to show you even just this small sampling of Da Zibao that we see on exhibit here. Look, what stuff is so and so made of? Can uh, so and so. In a zuilian, look at the wicked face of so and so, and or comrades, please look at the following facts. Um, we must keep our eyes open. You know, so there is a lot of a very visual and a kind of a, you know, uh, you know the metaphors and also the verbs of look and the the kind of the command and the compulsion to look and read, and not just actually they never say qing du, they always say qing kan. Look, look is a more ambiguous kind of a verb of, um, you know, vision, you know, the do, do is you have to really read, you know. Um, and the, you know, the, I always tell my students in my class that, you know, um, they actually, they, they rarely, they sometimes do, but certainly not as frequently would they command people to think. They don't say, 请想. <laughs> no, always you know, and so here, you know, the last one, so now the people have opened their eyes. No matter what kind of harmful things you did to the party and the people, the people would see you all clearly. So I find this intensely kind of um, optical and, you know, visual aspect of the Cultural Revolution um, truly kind of uh, fascinating, you know, this, um, 
and you can see also the um, on the that's about, you know, on exhibit um, here uh, this time. You know, all this, you know, the Qing Kan is being, um, you know, kind of circled with red ink. And the other one on top of it, you can see Kan, uh, so and so, Ying Zui Lian. And so, not only that, but also the, so, um, the people who are looking at that about themselves are also under intense scrutiny. So that you know, in the one case, you know, where uh, a person is being denounced because he obviously doesn't like to look at that about, but also you know, whether imaginary or real, they said that you know he would break into a sweat whenever he looks at that about. So it's like all the viewers of that about are also placed under intense kind of a, um, inspection and a scrutiny. And another thing is that they also try to train people into close readers and close viewers. So for example, this number 10 of the Das Wang exhibit, who drew the portrait of Chairman Mao in the auditorium? Why is there a scar right on the chairman's neck? <laughs> <laughs> you think maybe a slip of the brush? No, this is, you know, you know, cha chao bu yi ba on the on the neck. So you they look very closely, you know, and they just scrutinize this. I find this um quite fascinating. And also um another um one of the um you know last um you know uh observations I'd like to make is that um, actually very much like uh, what uh, Julia did um, uh, in her talk, this is an interesting kind of a, you know, um, coincidence here. I also talk about words, you know, kind of displayed in, in public places and intended for public consumption, you know, that is, you know, I try to situate, you know, such words, you know, like that's um, about, you know, in the kind of, in the long tradition of such words, you know, words, pub, you know, displayed in public spaces. I can, actually, you, you mentioned a lot of great, great examples. I can think of also um, with regard to the ephemeral comment by uh, Denise and also what you were, the inscriptions you were, you were talking about. I also think of the poetry boards, which is, you know, basically the poetry boards could be hung in way stations, temples and brothels and inns and taverns, you know. So those things are uh, semi permanent permanent because they can be taken off, right? They can be changed all the time. But then, you know, of course, when you situate the Dazibao in this kind of long tradition, you particularly kind of rather appreciate its unique place in this tradition because, um, you know, um, almost without exception, the Dazibao are almost always um, vilifying and angry words. So here's another thing. There's a you know there's an implicit command or a comp you know um, you know coercion of people to be angry. If you're not angry, then you're not a revolutionary. Revolutionary sentiments, you know, and are always almost exclusively anger. I always think of, you know, humor is actually the antithesis of revolution. But not only humor, but any laughter at all. But actually, uh, the revolution, you know, when it's, you know, carried out during the Cold Revolution is really in the extreme form of, you know, it's always expressed in this anger. So that's also kind of interesting, this compulsion to be, when you write a dazibo, you always have to sound very, very, you know, angry. And the words are always, you know, vilifying and angry words. So that's very different from any of the, you know, the words displayed in public, you know, in the long history of China. So that's another um, kind of observation um, I'd like to make. So finally, you know, just uh, um, last, and also, you know, this is a, uh, those words, kind of angry words, you know, and also kind of lead to more dazibao. It's like angry words, you know, lead to more angry words and also lead to memory of things that, that supposedly make you angry. So like this one, you know, after I saw the dazibao titled Humans and Demons are Confused and so on and so forth, it reminded me of something. It happened in March 1965. So this clearly is, this is a reader turned into a dazibao writer, you know. Um, and finally, you know, um, a last example is, is so that impresses me is this one, number seven. So this one is actually, um, the, the Dazibao writer is talking about, um, you know, a, a terrible thing that being done to a revolutionary party member, which is in order to create a confusion, he posted big slogan banners and big character posters on the door of a revolutionary party member's home late at night. And that's actually indeed exactly the time of the day when a lot of the Dazibao go up. Um, you know, um, whether it's signed or not, 
that side, you know, the people often do that. And imagine in the morning, if it's on your own house door, you open up the door, and you know, you see your house being <laughs> posted all over with with these angry words denouncing you, or supposedly uh, revealing your true color, right? You know. So that's so. Anyway, so the last words I want to say is basically, I think you know the the. That's about, you know, always at least makes me think of a lot of things, you know, and also there are a lot of questions I have, you know, so um, how do, how, how does this change, you know, people's, you know, the Chinese people's relation to words and also this all this fascination, this overuse and abuse of words and use words to abuse. This is such a fascinating kind of a phenomenon. Um, I always think even nowadays I go to China, I'm always impressed by how many words I see in public places, even on the back of the taxi or big boards, you know, bulletin boards and all over this place. The city is often filled with words. That's something that I haven't noticed or found in many Many other places of the world that I've traveled to. So that's one thing. Another thing I often think about, you know, the if we think about the effects of trauma, you know, I always think of Wen Hua Da Geming and especially the use of Da Zibao in the early years of, of the Cultural Revolution. Later on, I think people sort of become numb to it. You know, people just say, oh, yeah, 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 you know, there's another Da Zibao again, you know, and also the, the revolution, the movement gradually became a little bit of a kind of a losses momentum in the last few years of um, the uh, CR. But, you know, no, but I always think, you know, what a kind of a peculiar and exquisite form of torture this is. You know, that is the, the com being compelled to um, to look and to write, to turn out words and to look at words or just to view words. So what kind of effects of trauma, you know, would still be manifested? I think even, you know, sometimes a second degree trauma, sometimes, you know, this passed on from parents to children and then to their children, you know, so it's, I feel that there are a lot of kind of uh, questions and still interesting things, even in contemporary China, Chinese society, as I think pro probably could be traced back to the Cultural Revolution. Okay, that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. <laughs> I actually took Professor Tian's class on the Cultural Revolution 17 years ago as an undergraduate, so I really learned a great deal about the art of close reading, um, especially from this period that I usually are considered not to have produced any great works of literature, but um, I think we have just uh, seen how a literary approach to this uh, can actually be extremely illuminating. Um, I'm actually going to talk a little bit about everyday life, and uh, of course that's about immersion at a moment uh, that was extraordinary, but there is still everyday life, and um, some of what I'm talking about might, might overlap with the previous presentation, but um, I'm interested in the grassroots everyday practice um, of that's about how they are produced and received, um, experienced and remembered. So um, there are th three main questions I want to ask. Uh, the first is where were that's about? Um, the second is how how were they written and also how, how were they read, uh, giving some very specific case studies. Um, so um, some, I guess, um, the makers of the Dats Bao in um, on exhibit at the Fairbank Center, they would not have imagined an exhibition of their works um, here at all. But um, all Dats Bao were written for some some form of public display or some form of public exhibition. And their original exhibition contexts are largely public. So streets um, would be one place. Another, other places would be schools and factories and work units. Um, and because big character posters um, have big characters ca that can be legible from a distance, um, even though, of course, some of them are just to, for pure display. Um, they competed for public attention, and they're also remembered as pu tian gai di, kind of blotting out the sky and covering the earth. And um, um, But um, apart from repeating slogans and uh, copying from newspapers, a lot of these dots about featured extremely private content, um, and they also long personal attacks against individuals that are well known to a community. So that's about was by nature extremely exhibitionist. So exhibition, um, beyond just putting on an exhibition, I guess the, the, the idea of Khan is very much part of, part of that exhibitionism. Um, but 
Um, as much as there were public exposures of private conflicts, uh, that's about also where public invasions into more private spheres. Um, so they appeared not only on the streets and in work units, but also in uh, residential neighborhoods and even the homes of targeted individuals. Uh, so these are actually, that's about from um, the, that were posted in the home or in front of the door of, um, of a teacher in Beijing's um, um, uh, middle school, a uh, girls' middle school. Her name was Bian Zhongyun, and she was one of the first uh, victim, famous victims of the Cultural Revolution. And um, Red Guards had posted these, um, uh, that's about on her house before beating her to death, basically, in August of 1966. So I want to show you a clip from the documentary film, um, Though I Am Gone, by Hu Jie, that, um, uh, where he interviews the husband of uh, the victim, Bian Zhongyun.这个漫画当时是贴在什么地方 确实，这个在原书里带领之下，一百多学生包围住宅，好的，我们家里进行调查，收集无限的材料，这个铁打子堡，这是的，这就是他的寝室，嗯，他是书房，书房寝室贴在这里，嗯，我的房子不是。哦，贴了以后你也你们也没有。我不知道是为什么你不让撕下来呢？啊，没，我是我也是留经常大家看了。就是当时就是一直在家里，一直。你当时拍这个照片的时候是从哪个角度拍的？我这这我这，哇塞
So um, for the second question about how that's about were produced and written, um, so like why were the revolutionary masses so interested in generating these tens of millions of that's about and what what really created this kind of nationwide graphomania? Um, I think a lot of memoirs and conversations with people who lived through the Cultural Revolution actually suggest that schools, factories, and work units organized a lot of that's about writing sessions to demonstrate uh, revolutionary fervor. The more that's about the you produce, the more revolutionary you are. And many of these are just copied from editorials and newspapers, um, and others maybe composed their own content. Um, a, a good essay that I, my mother just told me that if someone write, wrote a really good essay in her middle school, then you know they would they would enlarge it as a dots bell um, with ink and brush. And for some people who didn't really care about the content, it was just about calligraphy exercise, right? So uh, if you had really good handwriting, then you you can go and then write all the dots about us, and, and they didn't really care um, about what was on it. But in some cases, of course, dots about was also, we can consider it as a pre-digital viral medium that actually transmitted heterodox thought in a time when publishing was not free. It's not po possible to publish your own thoughts. Anyone can write a dots about. So one really good example of that was Yula Ke's, uh, famous essay on family background, which um, uh, eventually caused his execution but admirers from around the country actually copied that particular essay and recopied it. So it circulated around the nation um, as a result of that spell. But revolution was often quite local, and people were encouraged and pressured to write that about uh, that attack not just public figures, but also colleagues and classmates, uh, friends and neighbors, or even family members. There are many stories about people's contrition of like writing a dots about against someone um, who is very close to them. Um, most of the dots about in this um, Fairbank Center exhibition are targeting cadres or co-workers in the very same factory as their authors. Um, so they're denouncing individuals who had already been exposed, um, uh, they, but, but, but are contributing new and incriminating anecdotes and details that are only privy to their authors. Uh, so crimes included the tyrannical treatment of workers, um, sexual harassment of women, reading of pornographic literature, abuse of cadre privileges, or even uh, earlier we have seen the very failure to write that's about. Um, so they articulate a lot of existing social tensions and conflicts within the work units. And sometimes, in, as in this case, um, I think it's very intriguing that they, invite, they invited um, rebuttals that are scribbled in even bigger characters um, by the accused individuals. So there's a palimpsestic aesthetics that also invites reading between the lines. If you want to see what's written underneath the large characters, then you have to read very carefully. So um, my last question is about reading. That's about how were they read. And I think it's quite interesting. I wanted to show this picture of children reading, because for children who are growing up, it's literally like a literacy primer. You learn how to read characters through reading that's about in a variety of handwriting, right? And um, many um, adults, of course, they also read that's about as they would read other bao. Bao is actually, uh, we translate uh, that's about as post, big character posters, but bao is the same character as newspaper. So um, it also functioned very much like newspaper, national news and local news, and also even neighborhood gossip is transmitted through the dots about. Um, it contained a lot more information and misinformation than printed newspapers. Um, and just as some wrote dots about to practice calligraphy, some also appreciated the, calli uh, the calligraphy of dots about as well. So um, I, I just want to close with some quotations uh, personal testimonies on reading dots about from two writers. Uh, the first is Chen Cengwen, uh, who uh, left actually a manuscript of his response to dots about against him at um, the, the Chinese Museum of History in Beijing, which was his work unit. Um, he, was, uh, uh, he was already in his 60s at the time and was really keeping a very low profile, but he was a renowned writer, and of course he was attacked. Um, after three days of reading Das Bo, this is the quotation, I finally understood that the Cultural Revolution movement at our museum has reached full spur swing. Even an insignificant person like myself can be the subject of a special column with several dozen dots about listing hundreds of mistakes written by well-intentioned comrades helping me with thought reform. 
If I am really ox devil and snake spirit, then I should no doubt be swept away. But naturally, I also feel pain and shock because my greatest announcer is uh, XX, a frequent guest of my home. His thoughts about educated me on what it means to benefit oneself at the expense of others. And then finally, um, from Yu Hua, the young, a younger writer who was born in 1960. And he really only seriously began reading that's about uh, by the mid-1970s um, in middle school. So he said, by then, people have been numbed into indifference by big character posters and seldom read the new expose that sprouted out overnight. Now, well on their way to losing all relevance, posters were becoming mere wallpaper. Um, but one day, he saw a cartoon of two of, the, of a man and a woman, actually, with a bed in the middle. So that intrigued him. And he said, it was the first poster I ever seriously spent time reading, sandwiched between revolutionary slogans and frequent quotations of Chairman Mao were exquisite little passages that told the story of a pair of fornicators in our small town. As rivalry between factions festered and conflicts grew, personal gossip, insult, and muckraking with the new weapons of choice. So he developed this taste for reading posters and made a point of stopping um, on his way from school to see whether there are any new posters and new go juicy gossip. Um, and for, so he, he said, for me, the big character posters function primarily as a form of erotica. So in the age of Da Zibao, he concludes, the human imagination was developed to the utmost. Da Zibao featured all literary tropes and techniques, from dramatization to hyperbole, metaphor to irony. It was on the street, in front of the thickening layers of Da Zibao, that I fell in love with literature. Thank you. Now just slightly grimmer subjects, but they've already been introduced. Uh, Safi talked about anger being a factor in the writing. And I, if you look at those posters, but particularly at the darts about themselves upstairs, uh, they look angry. They look as if they were done in anger. But I wonder, what were the emotions of the writers? They were being urged to write their fellow comrades were urging them to write. Uh, the authorities of the Cultural Revolution group, Mao's wife and others, were urging them to write. So it was ambition was there also, an enthusiasm and a feeling of power. What you have to remember is that the early Red Guards who wrote these, uh, uh, wrote these um, Dao Zibao, they were princelings. They were at the leading schools in China. Um, we just heard this terrible story <coughs> of the teacher Bien, uh, who was the first victim beaten to death at a girls' school in, uh, in, in Beijing. And there is a scholar in this country, Chinese scholar, who has done an investigation of some of the elite schools, 85 colleges, middle schools and elementary schools. And uh, at all of those, teachers were tortured. At 12 of them, the teacher was beaten to death. At one school, two teachers were beaten to death. Of the 13 schools where there were deaths, 11 were middle schools and two were elementary schools. So this was something where I think people, princelings as we call them now, felt, who are teachers? They lord it over us. They think they've got a bit of knowledge. But you know, we are going to inherit this country because we are who we are. And I think that was one of the emotions, a feeling of, I'm better than these people. I can do what I like to these people. They're dirt as far as I'm concerned. Now, that was challenged later by children of classes that had been attacked earlier on and that the princelings uh, were no longer in charge. But early on, that was an emotion, a feeling of superiority and a, a feeling of, now it's my chance to do what this nation has been about since 49. It's been about violent struggle. And violent struggle is how we got to 
win the victory of 49, and it's how we established our control over this state, and violent struggle is what I will now participate in. How did Mao come to unleash this? He had two personas, in my view. Uh, he was, of course, he was seeing himself, we see this in his poetry, as a leader in the long line of great leaders of China, and indeed surpassing them from Qin Shi Huangdi downwards, onwards, forwards. Um, but he also saw himself not just as a great leader, but as someone who, and many emperors I think felt like this, who felt trammeled but constricted by bureaucracy. And Mao particularly hated bureaucracy. He hated the fact that he couldn't do certain things because the party's rules didn't allow him or they said you shouldn't do this. It sounds a little bit like President Trump, doesn't he? Um, <laughs> and there were things he couldn't do. Uh, but he discovered the importance of the students early on when he tried to do something to the party. In the aftermath of the de-Stalinization in, uh, in Russia, he launched what he called a rectification campaign in 1957, uh, following on the Let a Hundred Flowers Bloom campaign of 56. And in that rectification campaign, he expected professors to do practice what he calls small democracy. That's to say they would sit around a table and they'd say, Comrade Carter, you shouldn't do this or you shouldn't do that. That was small democracy, you know, being nice to the people you were criticizing and not going too far. But he soon found that that developed into big democracy and in particular, it developed into big democracy on the campuses of China. And in particular, Peking University, the leading university and uh, the uh, place which everyone watches in, on other universities to see what they should be doing. Uh, there was a democracy wall, a first democracy wall on which posters were pinned, and a democracy plaza in which people spoke. Uh, and it was a student movement, in my view, at that time that frightened the party, and the chairman eventually gave way, and it led to the stopping of the rectification campaign, stopping of letting 100 flowers bloom, and to start the so-called anti-rightist campaign. But what Mao learned from that experience was that the students could be the shock troops of a revolution if he wanted it. But at that time, he still needed and wanted the party. By 66, he didn't want the party in the same way. He wanted a different party. He wanted a more revolutionary party. He feared that the party would go the way of the Russian party, just like Xi Jinping fears that there may be a collapse in China, which he has to prevent, a collapse of the Soviet type that happened in 1991. So in 1966, the Cultural Revolution that Mao launched was deliberately started on the campuses because there were the shock troops. There were the people who could be aroused by the call, Chairman Mao is under threat. Chairman Mao must be defended. And he must be defended by attacking his enemies. And of course, Mao wrote his own, my first big character poster, bombard the headquarters to rebel as justified. And uh, what he was saying to the Red Guards, as they called themselves eventually, what he was saying to the Red Guards was, this is your chance to attack the headquarters. And the headquarters could be the chief teacher, Madame Bien, who we heard the sad story about, or some other headquarters. The card is in charge of your factory, if you're a worker. It uh, could be the person in charge of your commune, if you were a peasant. So bombarding the headquarters meant everyone could be on the move. And the other persona of Chairman Mao, he was one, he was the, the em last emperor in a long line of emperors, perhaps, but he was also the monkey king, the one with the magic cudgel which he swings around and destroys everything. 
and that side of his persona came out in the Cultural Revolution. There were people, colleagues, who said Mao lost control of the Cultural Revolution. That's wrong. He didn't want control of the Cultural Revolution. Control was what the party was about. What he was about was unleashing the people to do what he thought they would do, which is to follow his thought and do the right thing. And so the Cultural Revolution politically was about this destroying the bureau bureaucracy of China in order to improve its revolutionary capabilities and make it a new bureaucracy. Now, Chairman Mao realized very, uh, very quickly that this was not a one-time effort, that the bureaucracy of China had been around over successive dynasties for several uh, hundreds of years, and that it would come back. And that's why he said, uh, we must have cultural revolutions every few years, uh, something which his short-lived successor, Hua Guofang, repeated and sealed his fate. Because no one in the party, when they recovered after Mao's death and came back into power, no one in the party leadership wanted another cultural revolution. They suffered too much during it. But Mao realized there had to be continual attacks on bureaucracy if the leader was going to be able to do what he ought to do, which is to lead. And I think that the, what you're seeing today in China is a different kind of cultural revolution. The difference is very obvious. The cultural revolution of Mao was run from the streets. Posters were put up. People were denounced by the masses. The anti-corruption campaign run by Xi Jinping to try and make the party pure. Mao wanted them revolutionary. Xi Jinping wants them pure. An even more difficult thing to achieve. That is being done from the center. It's tightly controlled. If you were to go up and accuse someone of corruption, you, an ordinary citizen, it's you who will suffer because they don't want anyone doing anything which is called a cultural revolutionary in the old style. But make no mistake about it. The bureaucrats, the leaders in China today, are not in danger, perhaps, of being taken to the people's stadium and being denounced, bending over, their heads down, placards around their necks, uh, and humiliated. But they are in danger as has already been shown in hundreds of cases, of uh, losing their wealth, of having their families and themselves disgraced, and having all the achievements which they feel they have done for the country over their career negated. So that the feeling of fear among the bureaucracy today, I think, while of a different kind to that that must have uh, imbued many people during the uh, 1960s is still there. There are no doubts about announcing Xi Jinping's enemies today. But there is the uh, discipline inspection group, and they will look into your affairs if they decide to do it, and you have no recourse against that happening. And they are much more precise, much more powerful than any Red Guard group. In the end, Mao realized that the Red Guards were going uh, too far, uh, too far in the sense that they were now, when uh, workers went to, uh, uh, to the campuses in Beijing, they were attacked and they were, some workers were killed. And Mao, I think, feared that if he didn't do something, the military might intervene. So he suppressed the Red Guards. But in the case of the present situation, uh, suppression doesn't seem at the moment to be on the cards. We have no indication that the retirement of the uh, anti-corruption czar, Wang Qishan, is going to lead to a retirement of the campaign which he has been leading. And so I think there is a lesson here for the bureaucracy and an important perhaps historic turning point for China as of the Cultural Revolution of 66 on and what's happening today. And that is, for the first time, really in Chinese history, the Chinese bureaucracy, as a bureaucracy, as a ruling elite, is threatened. Its position is threatened. 
there are other ways to rule, Mao said, it's more revolutionary ways. And uh, uh, Jiang, um, Xi Jinping says there are other ways to rule, it's, we must all be uncorrupt. But the impact on the bureaucracy, whatever the message, the impact on the bureaucracy is, I'm no longer in an unchallengeable position. People can challenge my position. They may be people on the streets, as they were in 66, 67, 68, or they may be people actually who are supposedly my comrades in the party machine. But I can be challenged by position as a bureaucrat, which has been sacrosanct throughout Chinese uh, imperial history as the rule of China. That is no longer the case. I am at risk. And if the Chinese Cultural Revolution that Mao launched did anything for China, it was perhaps to start a process by which China may one day relieve itself of depending only on bureaucratic dictatorial rule. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Uh, I speculated beforehand that the uh, whole would be greater than the sum of the extraordinary parts, and I think that's been, been realized. We have heard about continuities. We have heard about parallels, about echoes, about transmission, and finally about lessons. Um, and I think one, one conclusion I, I draw from that is that the effort to contextualize these ephemera from different approaches really, really yields uh, extraordinary fruit. Um, so thank you all. Thank you all so much. Uh, I'm going to start uh, by, uh, with a question uh, bringing us back to the... Um, the objects themselves. Um, and one of the things that, that came out in several of the presentations was their extraordinary, to us, extraordinary capacity to move people. To move people to betray family members and classmates and coworkers. To move people uh, to uh, uh, think about the world in a different way. And ultimately, as several of the presenters spoke, to move people to action. Um, the the uh, we we uh, as as teachers, we are often hoping that the texts we read will move our students, um, but surely we don't uh, we don't aspire to to uh, uh, move them in this way. Uh, there are so many uh, uh, stories in the scar literature, where, which is a, a, a genre of, of, of literature uh, that, that is, is, in many ways, it, it, largely about telling the story of personal experiences in the Cultural Revolution, where it's the appearance of a dazabal on one's door, on one's workplace, that begins the terrible transformation of an individual's and a family's life. Um, so the question I'd like to, to have you reflect on, and I'll leave it to, to the, those panelists who, I won't, I won't call on everyone, but those who, who would like to respond, this capacity of these posters to move, are they a, simply a product of the context in which they were produced? And that's about happened to be the vehicle by which these political impulses were unleashed? Or is there something inherent in this medium? Is there something about the Dad Zabal that give, gives them this power to more positively inculcate in Yuhua a love of literature, but in many more cases to, to lead people down paths with, with really quite devastating consequences? Want to, someone take, a Julie, do you want to take a stab? Maybe it's a combination. It's not an either or. I think it's certainly a lot. The context, the <laughs> things that were happening, talked about. But I think also, once people start writing the dots about, it kind of 
inspires others to do so, and it sort of takes on some momentum of its own. So I think it's really both. So you're picking up on the viral, the viral theme. I that, think uh, so, and I guess I was thinking of Twitter the other day too. Oh. <laughs> Um, I, I wanted to respond to saying that actually there was a lot of denunciations of family members or even of colleagues and so on. Before that's about emerged, there are other ways of denounce when um, work units came and investigate. Uh, so everyone had to write all these um, autobiographies and write uh, down your relationships to various uh, individuals and any suspicious activity that might have happened in the past. You're actually obligated to denounce. But that's about was public. So that made it very different from other forms of denouncing uh, denunciations to like a maybe like a bureaucracy um, that, uh, that that became maybe um, your victims uh, uh, their their archives mm -hmm. but that's all closed but that's about was really an op it, it created shame above all and I think that about apart from just anger right it expresses anger uh, some of that anger is performed but the shame that it produces mm -hmm. is actually the cause of a lot of suicides it's, it's, it's a particular kind of emotion that is produced by the Datsva, which is the airing of, of, of things that should not be public. Yeah, um, I just want to, you know, supplement by saying, I'm sure, you know, the Datsva exhibit here at Fairbank Center, when people are walking around and looking at it, you know, the effect they produce on our viewers here would be very different. So it's a very good question. You think of the context, and also the paratext surrounding, and that really drastically changes the meaning of, of these words, actually. Yeah. Thank you. Do you want to oh, sure. Um, I, as you were talking, I was thinking about uh, something that I write about in my forthcoming book, um, which is the uh, phenomenon of the uh, class education um, exhibitions, uh, um, which took place in the social education movement before this. And I think um, at one mo moment I was trying to figure out how big those um, bulletin boards were in the exhibition, because in these exhibitions, um, individuals were denounced, and this is happening all over the place, um, and their personal possessions might be in front of a poster board behind the table, um, outlining, accusing an individual, um, and outlining their crimes. Um, and people would have come through and viewed these objects um, and seen the posters. They might have copied down the text. They might have been uh, required to uh, go back to their own work unit and teach about the social education movement based on what they had seen. So in some ways, I think that was a rehearsal of this kind of individual denunciation, objects on display, um, and the, the posters, I, I actually cut out the size, are uh, not unlike a big character poster. Um, but I think that was different because um, those are not going to be um, in such individual uh, calligraph uh, calligraphy um, and those are not going to be signed by individuals. So I wonder what it is about the um, uh, personal nature of the handwriting and the attribution of individual writers that then um, makes it a matter of uh, of agency and, and a call to action. Thank you. The, the one, one issue that didn't come up t t in the presentation, Rod, maybe you might say a word or two about, is the way that Dadzabao enter the protest repertoire in China. They're actually uh, authorized by the Constitution in 1975 as one of the rights mm -hmm. of, the, of the working people is to, is to post big character posters. Uh, they have, stops helping, then removed. Yes, and then in 1980, they are removed yeah. uh, from 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 the Constitution, but remain a kind of central uh, a central element in the repertoire of posters. Uh, sorry, the repertoire repertoire of protest. Mm -hmm. Well, stops helping, of course, was very naughty to do that because <laughs> the whole of Democracy Wall, which was yet another Democracy Wall, mm -hmm. the one of 78, 79, was devoted to asking Deng Xiaoping to be brought back. Yeah. And he was actually appreciated. He he's told, I think it was one of the Western correspondents who asked him. He, he told one of the Western correspondents who uh, happened to meet him and asked him uh, that he appreciated what was being said on democracy war. But once he came back to power, uh, he realized uh, that and uh, it was not a good idea. And in 82, he went. 
Thank you very much. I think we will we'll now open the floor up for questions. Uh, here on the front. Just again. one comment on your, your, your point there. I think the. Uh, just one comment on the medium of the data bow. I mean, obviously, there are some long data bow, but basically, it's a short form. Namely, you write in big characters on a poster, and that means you have the kind of a Twitter format. Namely, you go for rudimentary bang bang thoughts, and you don't go for sophisticated, complex analysis. So it's a medium, it's a bang bang medium, and not a medium for sophisticated political analysis. And I think that is very important to keep that in mind. You know, that's. It dictates the rhetoric that is used. Maybe Xi Jinping should tell me he's writing Dao Zabao every day when he talks to President Trump. <laughs> that, was, that was the equivalent of a Rudolf Wagner tweet question. <laughs> James, here, please. <laughs> I know many of the panelists spoke about uh, the power of Dao Zabao for denunciation and also for various people to kind of declare their revolutionary uh, credentials. Do any of you find in today's online digital discourse in the United States, whether via tweeting, uh, uh, other short forms of communication, the same sort of uh, discourse of denunciation and correctness in terms of people declaring their positions relative to politics, the president's tweets, the gender war, et cetera. And, and what does this say about the, the role of the internet as a medium of a, of a new kind of digital dazabao? I was watching, I was, I was keeping track on my watch when we were going to hear the first Trump parallel, <laughs> about 5.15, and when we were going to hear the first internet, actually, the viral medium comparison raised it first. Who would like to address that very interesting question? I, I thought a lot about that. I, I do think there is a certain kind of, you know, the internet, for example, you know, you post the things, um, and there are a lot of, you know, very violent kind of uh, vilifying, you know, especially you can be anonymous, you can post a lot of, you know, very angry kind of complaints sort of thing. And also um, Twitter, you know, social media, I think there's definitely um, something similar going on, but also there's a kind of a profound difference, which is I think, you know, in the um, in China, in the Cultural Revolution period, the, the one thing I find really, you know, is that every turn you made, you couldn't avoid seeing that's about probably in remote rural area or in rural area where people are really, really busy, you know, doing things, you know, or they um, they probably didn't have the either the time nor the kind of, um, you know, probably sometimes even enough, you know, literacy to write and read a lot of that's about. But I think in a lot of, uh, you know, places in China during this period, you know, that's something that you, you couldn't avoid seeing, you know. So that's the, you know, so the, the words function sometimes, you know, as images rather than words, um, and also this inevitability of encounter, and uh, you're compelled to look even though you don't want to look, and if you really you know, try too hard, then you will be singled out as counter-revolutionary. And I think that certainly, you know, we can always turn off our social media or not even go on it at all, and just to turn to, choose to shut it down. So there is a kind of a difference, I think. That's, you know, just a, maybe my fellow panelists would like anyone to. Wanna, don't, I mean, you don't feel that you all need to respond to every question, but does anyone want to respond? Do I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, were most of the dots about signed by the people who wrote them? Yes. Or not? Oh, not. not. So right. the anonymity aspect might be similar to some of the Twitter denunciations. Yeah, actually. Most, the, most are signed. Most are signed. Most are signed. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. you must be responsible. You must, must be responsible what you are writing. If you are writing, eventually it's not correct. You got it. So all the names. Mm -hmm. So that would be a difference. I mean, so much of the stuff on Twitter is anonymous or it's pseudon pseudonymous or people don't identify themselves clearly. Mm -hmm. One thing that, that I thought was beautifully portrayed by your quote from your quotation from Yuhua was this idea of the thickness <laughs> of the posters, that they're actually physically agglomerating on the walls. Um, and I think that that, I mean, obviously the, so the, the, the social media commentary has is the thickness of that is in 
micro microns, <laughs> but it does have this kind of similar kind of accretion, visual, accreting right. yeah. kind of sense, though not a, not of course a, a visual one. Uh, any others want to? I'll, I'll, I'll count on you to just jump in if you want to respond to particular questions. The gentleman in the back there. Yep. Uh, thank you. Uh, so my question uh, to the panelists um, has to do with sort of the uh, the syntax and the uh, the wording of a lot of the Dao Zibao. Um I noticed, Dr. McFarquhar, that you mentioned um, the uh, the bombard the headquarters uh, by, uh, by Chairman Mao, and I was just uh, wondering. So uh, uh, clearly, you know, it was written to be very vague. Um, does the vagueness of many of the Dazibao suggest a sort of um, uh, carte blanche to uh, to attack regime enemies uh, at whatever level um, at whatever level they may appear? So uh, I, I suppose what I'm asking is that. Um, uh, well, certainly they um, you attacked anyone who was your headquarters. So if you're a worker, it would be the factory boss or maybe just the shop steward. Uh, if you're a person, it might be the a commune official. Or if you're an intellectual, uh, it might be the head of the department. Or if you were a student, it would be sadly a teacher. Um, but you would know more about the, um, the size and things. Anyone else would like to elaborate? No? <laughs> okay. uh, the gentleman there, and when you're finished your question, could you pass it to the woman in front? Okay. Yes. Uh, Rod, I, I found your uh, <clears throat> talk very impassioned, and I felt it's the kind of uh, ideas that we need to kind of focus on. And I was thinking that <clears throat> the children of the Cultural Revolution, the uh, middle schoolers, uh, must have been very heavily affected by the Cultural Revolution in their, in their deep psyche. And I was thinking, you, you, ins you triggered something in my mind about the uh, gentleman uh, event, which was actually a anti-corruption inspired event. It was not particularly powered by a pro-democracy movement. It uh, and I was I was actually thinking that some of those uh, students at that point might have been exposed to this era, the Cultural Revolution. And also, they're all, they're all like 50 years old now. They could also be inspired. And then, and then Xi has his slogan book, you know, his <laughs> and apparently Beijing is, is uh, no longer particularly colorful any longer with beggars on the streets and things like that, but it's basically uh, slogans, Xi's slogans. So the slogans seem to be reappearing. Well, leaders, uh, not just in China, but uh, in many countries, rely heavily on slogans and desperately during elections uh, look to find the right ones. Um, make a, America Great Again seemed to have won the last election. Um, I think that, uh, I think, I'm just trying to think, uh, if there are about 50 now, uh, they really wouldn't have, um, uh, they wouldn't have been affected by the Cultural Revolution except in tales, don't you think? Um, stories that, uh, I mean, I think a lot of the, a lot of the students who come to America anyway, who are, uh, in some sense, middle class students, either government uh, scholarship students or privately funded students, uh, a lot of their parents uh, probably have uh, some kind of uh, official or intellectual or uh, administrative or business uh, position and would have been old enough perhaps, or their grandparents would have been old enough to have experienced the Cultural Revolution. And I found when I was teaching course in the Cultural Revolution, I don't know if uh, you had the same feeling, uh, so I've heard that uh, many of the students uh, came up to me over the years after the course was over and said thank you because mum and dad, grandpa and grandma never told me about it. And what occurred to me was 
if you were of that class, if you were, had some intellectual or financial or administrative um, uh, clout in those days, uh, you were either beaten up, or if you were lucky, you did the beating. And either was not something you would be proud of. So I'm not surprised that kids didn't get told about it. So I suspect that the Tiananmen generation probably didn't know too much about it, uh, unless they had some very, uh, some very um, garrulous parents or grandparents. Although curious, oh sorry, Shafi, do you want to expand? No, you can go ahead. Oh, I, I do, I do want to respond to Ra's uh, comment. You know, I, I just also supplement. I think, you know, the, I, exactly, I also had that um, experience a lot. That is, you know, a lot of the students in my class on Cultural Revolution would, um, but they also tell me, they, they thank me for, you know, talking, you know, taking this course and uh, they learn a lot, but they also talk about how this actually vastly sometimes improved their relationship with their parents or grandparents because they said that they had a, for example, one of the projects, um, you know, as students to do is to choose a free, you know, something, you know, that you, you, for example, you can interview somebody, a family member and so on and so forth. When they do that, also when they acquire this kind of very heavily period vocabulary, um, you know, there's a lot of period of vocabulary which, you know, just seems so passe. Nobody would be using them anymore. But when the student learned that from this class and they kind of talk to their parents, grandparents, and they suddenly, you know, and it's like open up a floodgate, and they would say, actually, the reason why I didn't want to talk to you about this is because I think you would never understand, because you grow up in such a vastly different kind of time and environment. And so, you know, and then they feel very happy that the student would actually ask them informed kind of questions and uh, ask them to talk about that. And so that's one thing. Another thing to the, um, I, also, I also think that sometimes this kind of um, memory doesn't it probably consist in the, um, remembering a lot of things from the Cultural Revolution or, you know, or even when the parents, grandparents don't necessarily explicitly talk about it, I think sometimes it's the, the forms of fear and apprehension about things. That's deeply, you know, impacting on the children. That is, you know, that generation that went through the Cultural Revolution are so, um, you know, um, nervous and anxious about, you know, they read the newspaper articles very carefully, they worry about the consequences of saying something. That also can produce a big effect on, on their children, even when the children don't know exactly why the parents react to that way. Right. Yeah, yeah, so that's just a, yeah. Huh. Yes, I just uh, want to feel, make a few comments. I think this time the exhibition is uh, very special, and of course all the scholars, the teachers talking about uh, so the pictures, so the language, the literature, but the never, never we can have a chance to see the real ones. So especially those I saw, these uh, double writing ones, uh, it's like something like new discovery. It's also it's, it's already you know many years ago, but uh, this is like uh, from uh, a big tomb. It's like from the rooms. Uh, come out the real stuff. So uh, I think uh, the Fairbank Center did a very good job this time because they, uh, they organized scholars to, uh, to, to to discuss this and research this. And especially I tried to mention people about the art uh, aspect because uh, in front of those, uh, the double writing that's about a big posters, uh, you can see it's a paper you can touch. It's a calligraphy writing. Huh? It's a ink. Huh? Uh, it's a fighting on the paper. Uh, write very angry on the top writing because. So then, if we close the eyes, you can imagine all those uh, ink flying, huh? uh, like uh, the, uh, the, the 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 black dragon, huh? uh, because Chinese people are the descendants of dragon. Dragon is very abstract. What is dragon? Where is the dragon? Uh, so 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 this this. Uh, also, it's, uh, people uh, uh, live in dreams. Eh? So the, the dragon, the dream of the dragon, and the uh, dream of the bitterness, dream of the happiness, dream of the memory, dream of the future. So, so I think uh, it's very interesting for this art pieces by bringing you many interesting imaginations. So uh, I, I, I think the, uh, this is a miracle. These pieces are miracles, right? The collector is a miracle. And the film bank to do this exhibition is a miracle. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> no. 
Thank you. Um, I'm an undergrad from NYU, and I took five-hour bus to here from New York City. So, yeah. I, <laughs> so I would, would really love to ask two questions. Um, so first, uh, first one um, is about aesthetics in the big letter posters. Um, as Professor Li Jie um, said, sometimes they were um, calligraphy practice. And as Professor Tian said, they are uh, visual spectacles. Um, as you know, like in the ancient times, the old masters, when they write calligraphy, they don't really matter. The content doesn't really matter. It's just the form. Do you think it's good for us to view them as artworks and do some formal analysis on the big letter calligraphy um, instead of just seeing them as a cultural historical records, but see them as actual and serious artworks? Because in the case of Pan Tian Shou, I read his biography and. Uh, his um, that's about was stolen and um, collected by someone else because he was such a famous calligrapher and artist and people know that he wrote this so they just collect that. Um, is there any value that you found in the that's about that you find worth studying and worth some formal analysis? Five hour bus ride, you get two questions. <laughs> okay, the second one um, is about, um, so the question is how did um, the, the slogans become so large from, um, if you look at the posters um, of 1950s, so prior to um, the Cultural Revolution, they're mostly integrated in the paintings that they're like, um, they will be painted as couplets on a wall or somewhere. They are internalized in the painting instead of having the pure content spread out on a piece of paper like that's about. So how did it happen that people decide to get rid of the images and have the words only and the words alone to let them be the, the, the main content of a, of a, of a piece? Um, bef thank you. Before we respond, uh, we've had one Patient questioner, you want to talk? I'll, we'll collect his question as well, and then turn to the panelists to respond to each of the three questions as, as they wish, or to make some general concluding mm -hmm. remarks. Uh, thank you. So uh, it's a very simple question here. So I think posting, posting the Dazbo is important, but I'm curious whether in your research or observation that the removal or overriding of the Dazbo it's also also important because it reminds me of a very recent incident in Hong Kong that pro-government and pro-independent students are posting the Dazbao or the flyers. And the one issue then was that uh, whether you should remove or over overlap um, other Dazbao. Right. So the first question is whether whether the removal of that is, is important. The second question is if, if the answer is no, then whether there is a competition between the different Dazbao. Yeah. Thank you. So we have, we have three questions, and I think we'll, we'll uh, actually proceed, give everyone a chance to, to either respond to those three questions or generally to offer some thoughts and reflections on the panel, uh, on the participation of, uh, on the contribution of other panelists, or on, uh, I hesitate to say, this miraculous exhibition. <laughs> <laughs> Denise, do you want to start? Um, sure. I, I think I'll leave it to uh, my colleagues in the literature and our history to, to respond to the question of, about aesthetics. Um, I, I'm glad that the last question brought up the, um, the issue of uh, the umbrella movement in Hong Kong. I was in Hong Kong uh, in 2014, um, and it was really fascinating for me to watch um, the uh, creation and dissemination of public art, um, whether it was through cartoons that were reproduced or kind of cartoon bombing. I saw friends who were cartoonists putting things up in subway stations, um, all the little post-its that went up on the so-called Lenin wall um, in Central. Um, and so I, I think it's actually a, a really interesting question of um, what to uh, what to do with those and, and how they might be removed. In the case of Jing Zhejian, there was it was actually too much of a mess um, that the that the, the city authorities decided that it, there's too much paper all over the place. We have to clean it up. Um, and in in our day. Um, and in Hong Kong, there was a big um, kind of movement to try to preserve these things that were meant to be ephemeral. What do you do with a whole wall full of Post-it notes? Um, and so, uh, so now we have a kind of different 
consciousness where we want to collect everything and that's what makes these uh, posters on display so rare because they weren't collected um, in their time. Uh, so I think that the question of what to do with the, these ephemera um, is, uh, is one quite worthy of debate. Um, if I have a chance for just one more comment, I wanted to, to return to the question of uh, the media of Dazaba, which this gentleman in, in the front asked about um, how we might compare this to Twitter or other online forums. Because when you asked that question, I thought about um, the Hong Kong case, where people certainly used digital images and things circulated on Facebook. And there were photographs of cartoons, which also circulated. Um, but the, the physicality and the paper and the handwriting still really mattered. Um, and that's what made it so powerful to walk through um, Central or walk through Mong Kok and see these things you know, covering an entire bus, for example, or cars. Um, and it was really tremendously moving to see all of those things. And so I think it might be worth reflecting on the, the media of Dazabao as being um, perhaps more middle um, kind of um, occupying a more of a central position um, than we might think. Um, here we see Dadzabao used as, uh, as, as part of a movement of violence. Um, but I think in the Hong Kong case and in other Chinese cases, um, Professor McFarquhar talked about uh, the Hundred Flowers movement, that, it's, um, that there are uh, uh, that they're, that they, they have a very different tenor. And, um, and so I was trying to remember something um, that Philip Kuhn used to say about the Chinese Revolution and, and think about this in its larger context. So um, in his undergraduate lecture, he used to talk about the revolution as having two sides, an Enlightenment side and a Napoleonic um, side. Um, and I think here we're seeing one version of Dazabao that, um, but um, that there is a, a bigger um, bigger lens or view with which to, to think about the Chinese Revolution in the 20th century. Good. About the aesthetics, um, it seems to me you have to distinguish among different types of cultural revolution materials. I think the Dazabao are, you know, they're fairly buried even within that category, but some of them are just, you know, they're just like writing letters. You know, that isn't particularly aesthetic, it seems to me. On the other hand, it seems there was a concern for them to be legible and calligraphy to be good at writing Chinese characters. You have to practice for years and do it every day and that sort of thing. So that's exactly the kind of training that artists would uh, have experienced. So I think that's. Um, an argument for saying that there is a certain aesthetic aspect to it. I'm particularly struck by the large characters. Um, I'm reminded immediately when I see some of these uh, examples of the, the Tang calligrapher Yan Zhen Qing. And he was often held up in later times as being you know, really particularly forthright, upright, upstanding person. And it comes out in his calligraphy. So that's a really good model to imitate. And, um, there certainly were lots of model books to learn his style from. Uh, but then also uh, the pictorial posters. Um, we didn't talk at all about the lithographic, very colorful and often quite attractive posters that people would have as, you know, they would want them as decoration in their workplace or in their home, in their schools. And um, they, they aren't necessarily angry and uh, ferocious looking like some of the uh, red and black woodcut examples from the early uh, years of the Cultural Revolution. And particularly the ones that were kind of trying to rebuild the party after 1970 or so, those uh, have a completely different tone to them, it seems to me. I mean, they are more uh, positive and uplifting. And as a matter of fact, uh, when we had an exhibition in Madison, again, I have to put in a plug for the University of Wisconsin, 1996. We showed a collection of lithographic pictorial posters from the Cultural Revolution, two big galleries, one after another. And people experienced this exhibition as something that made them feel exhilarated. The comments that were in the gallery book that people would write, they were just really, they moved to joy because it was so positive. And, you know, the, the, what is it, the Hong Guang Liang, the red, bright, and shiny qualities that come out in the later posters. I mean, so there's, a, there's really a lot more to the visuality of the Cultural Revolution materials. Um, I wanted to ask a question, and I don't know if it's a 
sensitive question, but I have had the impression that officially you're not supposed to talk about the Cultural Revolution. So I was involved in an exhibition of the material culture of the cult of Confucius a few years ago at China Institute in New York. And this institution is dominated by a woman who came up through the Cultural Revolution, I would say, and she has a certain, um, well, let's say she's always on the right side of the political line. And when I wanted to talk in my curator's lecture about what happened to the cult of Confucius during the Cultural Revolution, she said, no, 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 no. So I, I'm curious, is this not something that people can talk about publicly? Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, just a, a few words uh, by way of responding to uh, the interesting questions about aesthetics. Um, I do think I agree with my co-panelists. I think the materiality, the physicality of the medium is, is very important. Um, you know, when you think about there's a lot of practical purposes for which, you know, you have to use a brush um, rather than pencil, for example, <laughs> or ball pen <laughs> or a pen. You know, you need to use brush and that calls for certain kind of a skill you know, technical skill, you have to be able to write that. And actually just to um, what uh, Julia just said, mentioned about this, um, you know, um, the aesthetics of a big character like Yan Zhenqing, that actually also reminds me of an interesting story about, you know, this is a fifth century emperor who was very clumsy at writing, you know, um, words. So when he was writing, so one of his very clever ministers advised him that, you know, so when you write a letter, um, you know, instead of writing in small hand, write it big because big characters can hide clumsiness. <laughs> it's aesthetically more pleasing. So I, I just thought also is it very true if you ever practice the calligraphy, you know that it's easier to write prettier, clearer, you know, uh, characters if you write it big. And so it's easier for viewers to see, you know. Um, it's also easier to write it in a clear, you know, legible hand and also prettier and all that. But the main question, you know, I, I'd like to also ask you to to think about is that did people, you know, I mean, we have the luxury and, you know, the kind of uh, standing back and looking back and we can certainly treat a lot of the things, you know, especially somebody like Pan Tian Shou's handwriting, we can think of it as art. When, when he was writing those things, whatever it was, did he think of it as art? And did the viewers of the time think of this as aesthetically pleasing? And, you know, I, I do think also it's very true that we can't take Da Zibo as a monolithic, just like a cultural evolution is such a multifaceted, you know, very complicated movement. I, I think, you know, yeah, so maybe in some cases people do enjoy the beautiful handwriting, you know, of certain Da Zibao or even the phrasing and so on and so forth. But, you know, if you're the target of the denouncement, then I think it's very hard, you know, when you're sweating in front of Da Zibao. I don't think that's the kind of response you would normally have to art, is to sweat <laughs> profusely. <laughs> and I think that's something to think about. And also the second question, why were more words than images? And a very simple answer, I think, you know, is that, you know, words have more capacity for kind of, uh, even though you say, you know, one image is more powerful than 10,000 words, but the words can give you a narrative, can tell a story, can, and also, you know, it's, um, um, it has more capacity for, um, for image. So, for example, you know, I do think that, you know, the, speaking of the multiple kind of uh, purposes and the natures of Da Zibao, I do think Da Zibao was also often functioning as a kind of venue through which people who really feel kind of powerless or have no voice in political life and the social life, they feel this is the chance for them to voice their opinion, vent their anger on abuse of power and corruption, you know. So, and so for example, one of the Dazwan exhibit is about this uh, party secretary, secretary Guo, uh, Guo Shuji Te Shu Hua, and it tells, you know, it's almost verging on the humorous, you know, one of the rare kind of a humorous Da Zibao, very vivid storytelling, um, talking about why, what exactly the Guo Shuji did, you know, and so on and so forth in a vivid kind of um, uh, lively style. So that's um, even using dialect, you know, kind of <laughs> dialectal speech. So that's the that's part of, sort of thing that I think images would have a trouble, you know, to capture and convey. So I <laughs> hope that 
sort of answer his question. Uh, um, actually, building on some of that, I think what, whether we consider Dazibao art or not, uh, it's, it's actually, Dazibao is challenging the boundaries of what we consider art. And when we put them on exhibition, actually we are, um, we're taking them out of their original context and then maybe reconsidering them as, as art. Um, but a lot of contemporary art and public art are actually taking art out of museums and uh, kind of putting, it's precisely having that new kind of context. So when we make, um, par um, um, when we compare that's about to graffiti, for example, and you know, can we consider graffiti as a serious art? Or a lot of contemporary art is actually challenging the establishment that frames art in museums. Um, but I I guess uh, because my um, my parents are, were both artists and they my father kind of he was like 16 17 years old when the Cultural Revolution started and in many ways the Cultural Revolution provided the a platform or a stage on which he was able to launch his art career by um, because there was so much paper available and uh, art, like being able to paint being able to having the drawing skills um, uh, exempted him from any kind of um, um, it, because he was was coming from a like uh, my grandfather was a rightist, but it, it didn't matter. He could still like put on a red guard armband because he could paint, he could draw, and uh, and then uh, his skill became an important part of the um, the dots. Uh, not so much the dots about, but being able to do woodcuts, for example, was uh, was a means through which uh, he was able to enter this art world and you know, acquire materials. So um, even though that was not the primary function of uh, um, Many people did not intend for Dazival to be art. Many, um, but um, but artists could still make use, or calligraphers could still make use of the Dazival. And maybe one final thing about the medium of Dazival that has some similarities to contemporary um, social media is that they're both very performative. And in some ways, if we want to um, think of Dazival as art, then it's it's a kind of performance art. Um, so that's. I hope your father didn't draw a picture of Liu Xiaoqi with a great big hammer on top of him. Well, actually, he, uh, the one just interesting anecdote I wanted to fill in is that he uh, he did a woodblock um, kind of a print of uh, Red Guard kind of standing on top of Niu Gui Shoshen, the ox devil and snake spirits. And when it was published, they cut out the negative characters. So those uh, they're not even supposed to be portrayed um, <laughs> when, when it was actually uh, in print. Um, I just like to uh, try an answer to Julia's question um, about uh, not mentioning the uh, Cultural Revolution. Of course not. I mean, the, the Communist Party of China has preserved over three great disasters. The first was the famine, the second was the Cultural Revolution, the third is ongoing. It's the desecration of the Chinese landscape, waters, and its atmosphere. Uh, which they're now working on. So, no, they don't want to mention that. And in, in, I was glad that um, Denise mentioned uh, the Hong Kong parallel, because uh, what the Dao's about are like, they're like communes, or how communes were described. They're big and they're public. And no government likes anything that's big and public not the Hong Kong government and not the Chinese government officials in the beginning of the Cultural Revolution. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll be very brief because you've been, it's been a long but very stimulating afternoon. Uh, I want to, um, first of all, uh, thank uh, our, uh, so actually, first of all, I want to answer Julia's question again very briefly by saying I'm not familiar with all of the rules for uh, what can and cannot be mentioned about the Cultural Revolution. But we were struck at the Fairbanks Center last year when the 50th anniversary of the beginning of the Cultural Revolution passed utterly without mention uh, in the official media of the PRC. We hear about every anniversary you can imagine. And this one was very quiet. And that was one of our inspirations behind this in uh, exhibition and behind this panel. Uh, thank you all so much. I want to repeat my thanks to the wonderful members of the Fairbanks Center team who have worked so hard, uh, to Susan Israel as well, who joined the team for the purpose of the exhibition, to the panelists. Uh, and I will end by uh, reminding, well, I'll borrow the words of Ken Xiaofei's comments, but in a slightly different tone. Please continue the conversation outside. Uh, enjoy the refreshments. But uh, do not forget um, to go upstairs and cut. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Without the food. Yes. Thank you all so much.